How did a publishing company known for publishing Garfield and Calvin and Hobbes take over the poetry publishing industry in the space of about 15 years? I want to tell you a story. So our story begins in the 1970s. In the 1970s, social media was newspapers. If you wanted to know what everyone else in America was reading and thinking about every morning of the weekday, and especially on the weekends, you turned to your newspaper. In your newspaper, you had comic strips. Everybody loves comic strips. The Peanuts, Garfield, Calvin and Hobbes, The Far Side. This was what people read in the last decades of the 20th century in their newspapers. But they also read movie reviews. They read humorous takes on politics and culture. Sometimes they even read cutting-edge reporting on political happenings, uh, on social happenings. There's a reason that people were able to read the same articles, the same comic strips in their newspapers around the nation. And this was because of syndication. Now, there are two men who are responsible for most of the comic strip syndication in America in the last couple decades of the 20th century. And these men are Jim Andrews and John McMeal. In the 1970s, Andrews and McMeal got together and started a company called the Universal Press Syndicate. Now, the Universal Press Syndicate picked up comic strips like Doonesbury, Kathy, and eventually Calvin and Hobbes. And what they did was they syndicated these comic strips on a weekly basis across the nation. But Andrews and McNeil weren't just interested in giving people a laugh. They also were interested in social happenings. One of the early things that McNeil and Andrews syndicated was an article by a man named Seymour Hirsch. Now, Seymour Hirsch was a journalist who had got a scoop on a cover-up in the army. Now, in the 70s, this was Vietnam era, and the army, it turned up, it turned out, had covered up a massacre in My Lai by the U.S. Army, and a whistleblower named Ronald Ridenauer wanted to break the silence, and so he talked to Seymour Hersh, and Seymour Hersh wrote this expose of an army cover-up of a massacre. And this ended up leading to, you know, you can go read about this on Wikipedia. This led to people getting court-martialed, people being uh, convicted of murder. Um, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty major news story. Life magazine wouldn't touch it, but Andrews and McNeil syndicated the write-up that Seymour Hersh did of this whistleblower's account, and it appeared in newspapers nationwide. So Andrews and McNeil were doing two things at once in their early syndication. They were making people laugh, but they were also keeping up with social issues that they thought people wanted to know about. But the primary thing they were doing was the comics. And in fact, just a couple years after the Universal Press Syndicate came out as a important a platform for syndicating comics, Andrews and McNeil decided, you know, there's a market for gift books, coffee table books, calendars that are using the comics that people love in their newspapers, but kind of putting them in a handy form where you can take it home. So they did this in several ways. They started publishing collections of, say, Doonesbury, Kathy, Calvin, and Hobbes uh, in hardback and paperback book format, but they also started publishing calendars. Now, if you're a certain age, you remember the the far side off the wall calendar. This was a calendar that you would tear off each new page each day. And each day had the date on it, but it also had a far side comic by Gary Larson. And it was fun every new day to tear off the last page and see what the new comic was for the day. And you got 365 days worth of a fun new Larson far side comic. This was made possible by Andrews McNeil Publishing. And so from the 70s and the 80s and 90s, McNeil and Andrews basically got control of all the major comic strips. You know, as I said, they started out with Doonesbury, Kathy, Calvin and Hobbes. They ended up getting the rights to Peanuts, to Garfield. They became the preeminent comics publisher, both in your newspapers 
and in gift book format and in calendars. In fact, the calendar department has always been one of the largest departments at Andrews McNeil Publishers. They also publish, though, books usually on the sort of more humor and popular end by writers like Irma Bombeck, uh, Roger Ebert. They publish some of his things. When I first found out about the Ebert thing, I was a little confused, but then I thought about it. Ebert really fix, fits into Andrews and McNeil's vision in that he's a writer whose movie reviews are syndicated all over in newspapers around the country. He's a popular syndicated writer, and so of course they're going to publish a book of his movie reviews or thoughts on life. And I think this is where Andrews and McNeil really were tapping into what we now call sort of the social media consciousness of America. They knew that people wanted to read things not just that lifted their spirits, gave them a chuckle, or maybe made them think about some important social issue, but also they wanted, they knew that people wanted to be reading the same things that people around the country are reading. You could say, hey, did you see the new Far Side comic, you know, in this Sunday's paper at the water cooler on Monday morning? If you're a, you know, office worker in the 80s or 90s, you would chuckle about how dumb that pun was in the Garfield comic. You could talk about, you know, did you agree with Robert Roger Ebert's review of Jaws or Back to the Future or Jurassic Park? And they wanted to be the publishers who were publishing these things. So what does poetry have to do with any of this? Certainly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Andrews and McNeil were not publishing books of poetry. Today, though, we know them as the largest poetry publisher in the nation, if not in the world. So what happened? I'll tell you what happened. 9-11 happened. In 2000, Andrews McNeil published a book called The Blue Day Book, which was a gift book. It was hardback. And it was funny pictures of animals with little kind of tongue-in-cheek life advice. You know, life got you down, and there's a picture of a sad monkey. You know, cheer up. This was... Not really something that should necessarily have sold well. The photography was okay, but it's, it's a silly gift book. But it was published in 2000. And it was prescient that they published this, and it got some popularity because September 11th happened. The nation was going through a tragedy. And on the Andrews McNeil website, they credit the Blue Day book with, quote, lifting the spirits of the nation in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Now, the Blue Day book is not a meditation on human suffering or a justification of a good God or a good universe in the face of moral evil. It's funny animals and kind of silly self-help sayings, certainly not in a very serious way. But that's what Andrews McNeil had figured out how to do. How do we help people who really do have important concerns on their minds have a laugh, smile, have a lift of feeling? In 2008, Andrews McNeil, kind of, I think, writing on this, like, we want to help people gain confidence, gain good spirits after 9-11, they publish a book of poetry, which, according to their website, as far as I can tell, is the first book of poetry they ever published. And this book of poetry is called Bikeman, an Epic Poem. That's Bikeman, one word, bike and man. This is by Terry Flynn, who's a TV writer, who lived in New York during the 9-11 attacks. And Flynn said that he got inspiration to write this book as he was dealing with the you know, trauma and suffering in the aftermath of 9-11, and he read Dante's Inferno. And he got the idea, I want to write a narrative poem about the, the sort of dark night, the dark wood, that I, that my city, New York, went through in the aftermath of those attacks. And so Bikeman, an epic poem, is, it's in free verse, but it's narrative, it starts with the author on the morning of 9-11 sitting outside reading, and he hears the commotion downtown and realizes what's going on, and it follows him through the events of 9-11 into the aftermath. It's a pretty serious book of poetry. It's certainly not lighthearted in a Calvin and Hobbes or Blue Day book sort of way, but it's accessible 
it's not dense, elusive, literary poetry. It's narrative poetry, and yet I think Flynn has a flair uh, for writing, if not memorable lines, at least lines that are pleasant to read, um, that communicate emotion pretty well. Um, probably Beichmann is the best book of poetry they've ever published when it comes to sheer um, inventiveness, sheer uh, respect of language, things like that. And in fact, after they published Beichmann, it would be five years before they published a book of poetry again. In 2013, an Australian writer of Cambodian origin named Lang Leave was getting popular on Instagram. Now, Lang Leave grew up in Thailand in a refugee camp. Her family was Cambodian, and they had escaped the Khmer Rouge, you know, brutal regime in Cambodia. And they ended up relocating to Australia. And there, uh, Lang went to college, um, studied fine arts, and started writing poetry and designing fashion. And she got a following on Instagram, both through her fashion design, but eventually also through her poems. Now, her poems are simple, they're straightforward. Um, there's, there's a sort of like self-help um, through suffering um, theme in them. And I think this is something that we're going to see all throughout the rest of the story of Andrews McNeil Publishing. They're interested in voices that kind of blend this, talking about real social issues, but in a really straightforward, didactic, you can get through this, I know this is hard, but you're strong sort of vibe. So Lang Leave got enough followers on Instagram that she put out a self-published book called Love and Misadventure. And uh, it sold pretty well uh, on Amazon through their uh, Kindle Direct Publishing or the um, uh, Create Space Independent Publishers was the, uh, the previous version of Kindle Direct Publishing. Create Space is where she first published this. And it, it sold well enough that it came onto Andrews and McNeil's radar. And they reached out to her and basically gave her a publishing deal that they would republish Love and Misadventure under the Andrews McNeil publishers. So this was the second book of poetry that Andrews and McNeil had ever published after Beichmann, and it had been about five years. So this is, was in 2013, 2014, when this happened. And Lang Leaves Love and Misadventure became a hit. In fact, it became such a hit that it became kind of a publishing model for what Andrews and McNeil would look for in their next few publishing ventures. Now, at this time, Andrews and McNeil was still publishing comics. Uh, they had picked up Foxtrot. They had picked up um, Dilbert. They had picked up, you know, all, the, all these um, comics that are still syndicated that we still sort of read in the newspapers or online today. But one of the things that I think in 2013 Andrews and McNeil was starting to see was that newspapers were no longer the major form of social media in American culture. It was starting to be Instagram. And so instead of looking at what are people reading in newspapers and how can we print more of that, to meet public interest and demand. It's what are people clicking like on on Instagram. This led to the publication of a poet who now I think is probably the best known poet in the world, certainly the best known English language poet in the world. That's right, I'm talking about Rupi Kaur. Now Rupi Kaur has a similar story to Leave in that she started off on Instagram she has an interesting, a non-Western background, and her Instagram following led to Andrews and McNeil thinking that it was a lucrative publishing opportunity to publish her self-published book. So Rupi Kaur uh, is originally from India, and uh, she didn't end up in Australia like Leave did. She ended up in Canada. And in Canada, she wrote poetry. She uh, would perform her poetry on YouTube. Uh, she would do little sketches on Instagram that would often, um, often be kind of illustrations of a topic that she wrote a short poem about. And these got a major following on Instagram. She was also talking about things that were in the social consciousness in 2014, 2015. Uh, remember, this was sort of the, um, the lead up to the 2016 election. A lot of questions about immigration, about women's issues, 
um, about kind of third wave and fourth wave feminism was coming up. And Coor and Leave were these voices that were um, non-Western, they were female voices, and they were talking about things that weren't necessarily the main things that uh, writers in America were often talking about. And so they seem to be coming from unique, and I think this is important, lucrative sources. Now, the lucrative sources wasn't that these are voices from, uh, from Cambodia, Thailand, India. The lucrativeness was totally based in Instagram following. But I think that the interest that people like Leave and Coor um, drummed up in people was that they were voices that sounded a little different than the voices other people were hearing and or the kind of mainstream American culture. And yet, Coor and Leave were talking about things in a language that was precisely the language of teens and 20-somethings on the internet in 2013 through 2015. So Rupi Coor, uh, I think my favorite poem from her... Uh, is, uh, this is the whole poem, it goes, you are your own soulmate. I'll say it again, you are your own soulmate. That's the whole poem. I'm not going to critique this poem from a literary angle. I'm only going to say those are simple, one-syllable words that any high schooler on the internet can understand. It has a sort of self-helpy, encouraging vibe, but it's also set in a context that seems to be like an older friend or sister encouraging you in a difficult situation. And it was precisely that that people latched onto in core. And so um, Milk and Honey, which was first self-published, uh, in 2014, was picked up in 2015 by Andrews McNeil, and it became the best-selling poetry book, not just that Andrews McNeil had ever published, but it became the best-selling and most translated poetry book in the mid-20-teens in the world. It's pub published in more than a dozen languages. It is probably the major poetry publication um, of the 21st century. This definitely gave Andrews McNeil impetus to just recycle this model. Um, the next major poet they would publish uh, is a poet whose uh, his, his given name is Reuben Holmes, but he publishes under R.H. Sin. Uh, R.H. is Reuben Holmes, and Sin is... Um, uh, he's talked about how uh, Sin... Is, that, that's not like the... Uh, the English word for, um, you know, moral evil, but um, he said it's based on Egyptian mythology. Um, R.H. Sin uh, had a series of books that he started publishing, once again, self-publishing, that got a lot of following on Instagram. And, uh, and his book series that he started out with was called Whiskey, Words, and a Shovel. And R.H. Sin is, once again, writing these very short poems. They're often addressed to a female audience from a sort of like a big brother protector figure um, uh, attitude. Uh, giving people encouragement through hard times. This is why I think the Blue Day book is important to keep in mind. Light-hearted and yet sincere encouragement in difficult times is what Andrews McNeil found over and over from 2000 through the 20 teens was popular and would sell like hotcakes. R.H. Sin got picked up. Another poet that got picked up that kind of doesn't fit this mold as well is Amanda Lovelace. Now, Amanda Lovelace's uh, first book was published in 2017 uh, by Andrews McNeil. And um, uh, Amanda Lovelace's uh, first book is called The Princess Saves Herself in this one. So if you look at the poems, they're very similar to a Lang Leave, Rupi Kaur, R.H. Sin type poem. They're addressed to young women, um, and yet they have a fairy tale theme. But it's a very explicitly, like, these are feminist reimaginings of fairy tale themes. She doesn't tell whole fairy tales. Most of her poems are just a couple lines long. But it's sort of a um, uh, really broad, um, uh, I don't necessarily want to cl say cliche, though a lot of people have said cliche, um, kind of broad, often heard criticisms of fairy tale tropes, she turns into poems. Now, um, 
Amanda Lovelace didn't get Instagram famous, though she did have a Twitter following before uh, she got published, but she once again self-published, and Andrews McNeil picked it up, even though she didn't have an Instagram following. So Andrews McNeil was taking chances on poets who didn't necessarily fit the Langleave and uh, Rupi Kaur model, and yet they were still looking for the self-published to professionally published poet. One of the things that Lovelace, Coor, Sin, and Leave have in common is none of them have Masters of Fine Arts in poetry degrees. This is often sort of the conventional degree that most literary writers have. None of them have MFA degrees. Lots of them have college degrees, though I think R.H. Sin has talked in, um, in interviews about how he didn't go to college. He saw his friends basically get into lots of debt and get very little out of college. Um, Lang Leave and Ruby Kaur um, are from non-Western backgrounds. Uh, R.H. Sin and Amanda Lovelace are Americans, born and raised in America. So there are some differences, and yet this, from self-publishing uh, and internet popularity to massive sales and really clever syndication. Now, syndication, I don't mean um, these poems are showing up in newspapers, Um Anderson McNeil's distribution is incredible. If you go to Walmart, if you go to Target, if you go to Barnes & Noble, if you go to your you know local indie bookstore, Andrews McNeil has made sure that Ruby Coors and R.H. Sins and Amanda Lovelace's books are on the shelf. Andrews McNeil, decades ago, figured out how to get their books and their writers in front of, in front of as many people as possible. They're one of the best distributors in the world. And... I think these deals that Andrews McNeil has made, um, especially with Rupi Kaur's translators all over the world, they're really good at it. Now, who was behind this? Why did this happen? What, why this boom in poetry popularity basically from 2008 to 2017, 2018? Well, if you go on LinkedIn and look through the editors, you find one name keep popping up, Patty Rice. Now, Patty Rice has been an editor in one capacity or another with Andrews McNeil from about 1991 onward. But in 2012, she became the senior editor, and then in 2018, she became the executive editor. And on her LinkedIn page, she talks about how she has overseen the publication of R.H. Sin's Whiskey, Words, and a Shovel, overseen um, the publication of Amanda Lovelace, of Lang Leave, of Rupi Kaur's books. And Rupi Kaur, L Lang Leave, and Amanda Lovelace in particular, they now have five or six books with Andrews McNeil. Um, and you see this turn take place from uh, 2019 through the present, where these writers, you know, they have three, four, five books under their belt of poetry. They have, you know, millions of followers on Instagram and YouTube. They've now started writing more explicitly and blatantly self-help books, often in the form of journals. You know, here's an exercise for self-love today, you know. Write a poem about five things you love about your face. You know, things like this. Um, and so they're really trying to engage really explicitly on the um, self-improvement, self-help, and self-love aspects and themes of their poetry. Lovelace and Coor in particular have done this. People like Leaf have branched out into writing novels. Um, R.H. Sin um, has uh, finished the Whiskey Words and a Shovel uh, trilogy uh, and has started, you know, um, other thematic focuses in his books. Art is often involved in this. Once again, art not drawn by people who have bachelors of fine arts in drawing and painting or masters of fine arts in design, but art that is, um, that is uh, pretty amateur, um, art that maybe, you know, an art critic wouldn't even take the time of day with. Um, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Um, this is uh, Rupi Kaur, um, a poem and a drawing. You can tell what the drawing is, um, but... Um, you know, this is not uh, this is not necessarily something you would buy to frame and put on your wall for the sheer beauty of the art. And yet, the simple image goes along with the theme of the poem. The poem is, I don't know why I split myself open for others knowing sewing myself up hurts this much afterward. So we've been going for a while, and we've told an interesting story. And I want to I conclude with a couple observations. 
We've talked about how Andrews McMeal has been interested since the 1970s in this intersection between finding what everyone wants to read and is reading and talking about at the same time and overlapping it with two, I think, deep human desires. We want to hear about the important and essential things that are going on in people's lives. And we want encouragement in the difficulties of our own lives. Traditionally, we would call this, I think, an urge uh, for didacticism in literature and art. We want to be told how to live. We want instructions for living. But we want them in a way that's palatable, right? We don't want dogmatic moralism, but we also don't just want frivolous nothingness, right? The description of a, the beauty of a rose that doesn't remind me that life is worth living in an explicit telegraphed way, we might be suspect of. And Rupi Kaur, Lang Leave, Amanda Lovelace, R.H. Sin, The Blue Day Book, um, for what it's worth, Dilbert, I know the Dilbert creator has you know, gotten a lot of uh, I don't know, criticism lately, but I think even things like Dilbert or Peanuts, um, Calvin and Hobbes, they have this reminding us of what it means to take ourselves a little more lightly and to get through that which can be often difficult. Like Pulitzer Prizes were awarded to Andrews McMeal comic writers, and Andrews McMeal is really proud of that. So Andrews McMeal has, according to their website, a 50% share in the poetry publishing market in America. 50% of all poetry that's published in America is published by Andrews McMeal. None of their major writers have Masters of Fine Arts in Poetry. None of their major writers publish their poems uh, in literary journals. And if you look around YouTube, if you look around the internet, you'll see that most of their writers are widely lambasted by the literary establishment. I don't just mean college professors. I mean booktubers on this very platform often complain widely about the banalities, about the hilarious um, inadequacy of poetry by Rupi Kaur, Amanda Lovelace, R.H. Sin, Lang Leave, and others. If you go on Andrews McMeal's website, you'll see they publish dozens and dozens of other poets, but they're all in this mold. Andrews McMeal does not care about the literary establishment. They don't care about Pulitzer Prizes in poetry, though they very much care about them in comics publishing. And if you look, say, in 2008, when they published uh, Bikeman at the popular literary poetry, you'll see people like Mary Oliver, Billy Collins, um, uh, Robert Haas, who won the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize in 2008 for a book of incredible poetry. Um that has very little in common with Beichmann, let alone Milk and Honey. What Andrews McMeal has done is created a bifurcation between popular level poetry that you can buy at any place the books are sold and literary poetry, which you have to actually like do a little research to even find out about. There's a lot of debate as to whether Andrews McMeal has been good for poetry or not. I think they've been good for poetry in that people feel like poetry is something they can read again. In 2013, with the publication of Lang Leave, in 2015, with the publication of Ruby Kaur, people who never read poetry for fun, or at least poetry by living authors, started caring about poetry again. But the kind of poetry they cared about again was, I have to say, the worst poetry that is being professionally published in America. It's poetry, kind of. We could spend a whole 30 minutes talking about the inadequacies at the very basic level of these poems. These poems, for instance, have never been workshopped. Other YouTubers have pointed this out. If you took a Langley poem, an R.H. Sin poem, a Amanda Lovelace poem to a undergraduate poetry workshop, it might be laughed out of the classroom if it was a not very uh, sympathetic group. Um, the quality of these poems as poetry is incredibly low. And yet, the popularity is higher than at any time in my lifetime of these poems, of poetry in general. Lang Leave said that she's gotten messages from people expressing 
uh, expressing delight and surprise that she's alive because she said they found her book, you know, next to Edgar Allan Poe and Shakespeare at Barnes and Noble, and they figured she was a poet who lived a hundred years ago. And they realized, no, she's a forty-one-year-old poet, you know, living in Australia. Um, and they were so happy that they knew of a living poet. There's a lot to unpack here, and we've been going for a while. And I want to close up this video essay. But I think it's safe to say, pay attention to who's publishing the poetry, why they're publishing it, and what it says about what our culture is hungry for. Andrews McNeil has been an important force in American culture, and I think they're going to go on being an important force. And we need to pay attention to who they're publishing and why. And take a look at the state of the art. Poetry is more popular than it's been in 50 years. And the quality of poetry that most people are reading is the lowest it's been in a long time. What should we do about that? Talk about it down in the comments. Thanks for hanging out and going on this journey with us.